Well, good evening, everybody. Hope uh, or day, which whenever you're watching this, uh, hope everybody is doing well. We are studying uh, our devotional, uh, No More Excuses, by Dr. Tony Evans. And um, so I'm, I hope that uh, as you join us tonight, uh, you'll grab a pen, a uh, piece of paper, and, and your Bible, and maybe jot down some things that will help you as you are going through your journey with the Lord. I uh, just want to say thank you to everybody that attended on uh, Mother's Day. I thought we had a, just a, uh, uh, a fantastic Mother's Day service at the church. And uh, obviously, um, if you were there, you, uh, you saw something that happened that uh, wasn't planned. Uh, I didn't know the little fella, little boy, was going to uh, have a prayer request uh, for his dog. And um, I don't know what is uh, the little guy, maybe three, two or three. But uh, he, uh, he thought his dog got bit by a coyote. And so he was worried that, uh, that the little dog might have been bit by a coyote. And so that was on his mind, and he wanted to ask prayer for it. And so he initially wave, raised his hand, and I thought he was waving at me, so I, uh, I waved back at him. And then I realized that he was wanting to do a prayer request, and uh, uh, he prayed, asked prayer for his uh, his dog. And I didn't have plan on doing this, but the Lord just prompted me, bring him down front. Have it. I said, come here, man. Come here, little buddy. Come down here with me. And I just sat down on the altar and put him on my lap and... Uh, I use that as a, a moment that, hey, God hears our prayers no, how, no matter how big or how small they might be. And um, certainly that was a, a blessing for me uh, to be able to do it. I, I'd like to tell you that I'm a genius. <laughs> and you thought I would uh, have this great moment uh, for, you know, to teach everybody, but it just happened and, you know, I rode with it. So uh, y'all um, uh, remember our kids are listening. I, you know, I, I know sometimes you don't think they are, uh, but um, they're listening and they're hearing. And, um, you know, we got to keep we got to keep working with them. With that said, I'm excited. Um, we're going to restart Children's Church um, uh, maybe in June. I, I'm, I'm going to back off of that for just a little bit because uh, we originally committed to the first Sunday in June. Uh, I've got a list together uh, of a bunch of folks that are going to help us with that ministry. And so I want to meet with them first and see about getting them a curriculum. Uh, and then we'll, you know, we may back it up a week or two. Won't go too long. Uh, but um, so um, I'm excited about that. We'll get, you know, we'll get that children's church thing running back up. I I'm really excited, though, for the people that are willing to help and uh you know, looks like at this point that uh, folks are only going to have to do it, you know, maybe once every six weeks, uh, which is really good, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that. Hey, I, I want to say one other thing that is that I have noticed, um, I've noticed a big change in our uh, congregation uh, from, from where I'm standing and looking out. I've seen a big change. I, I remember uh, I'll have... Uh, seven years completed in September. I came to you all in uh, September of 2014. And uh, I remember there was, it was hard to get somebody to say amen or, or uh, any of that. And I don't remember anybody lifting their hands uh, in praise to the Lord. And, and I noticed Sunday that, um, you know, there was amens all over the place. And there was many, many people with their hands raised praising the Lord, and I am so excited about that, that we're, you know, that uh, we're, as a church, are moving into a place where we're just letting go and letting God move in our midst, and if He touches you, you know, you lift up your hand, you say amen, you you give Him praise, and that's that's what worshiping is, is all about, and so, you know, I just wanted to tell you that I'm so proud that you guys are, are hearing the voice of God, and you're... Um, uh, you're you're responding as he uh, moves you on on Sunday morning, and uh, so uh, I'm just thrilled with that. Hey, listen, um, live stream is going to be a little bit different Sunday morning. Okay, um, I'm not going to give it away, um, but it will be different. Okay, uh, so uh, what's going on at the church and the live stream may be two different things. Okay. Uh, so, 
anyways, uh, I'll just leave it at that. So if you happen to miss church, the live stream will be up. Or if you go to church, you'll be able to catch the live stream when um, later because this records it and saves it. You'll be able to watch it later um, at a later date. So um, anyways, we'll move forward with that. Got several of you on here tonight. If you want to grab your Bibles and a piece of paper and a pen, uh, we are going through again this book um, no more excuses. It's a 90-day devotional for, from Dr. Tony Evans. We are on Lesson 18, uh, and uh, we're just going to work our way through this over the summer and and, uh, and go from there. Tonight, we want to talk about... We've been talking about Joseph, and the, the lesson has been about Joseph through this whole thing, how Joseph, how Joseph got himself in the mess by no fault of his own, his father loves him more than the other brothers. The father shows it. He plays favoritism. The brothers hate Joseph for it. They put him in a, you know. And now, listen, some of y'all may be in bigger families that have had, had this happen, that your family member, your mom, your dad, whatever, played favoritism, and, and you knew it. You knew you weren't the favorite. You knew that, that uh, the other one was. Uh, and, you know, that, that stuff, I'm, I would imagine, hurts. Now, you know, I'm, I have always been my mama's favorite, um, primarily because I'm my mama's only one. So <laughs> I never had to deal with that. But, um, you know, some of y'all may have grew up in families that, that this is the case, that, you know, that you knew that you, were the, you weren't the favorite or, or somebody was, got away with more than you did. Um, I, you know, if you're the uh, firstborn you, and, and, and got a younger siblings, you probably think they got away with, with more than you did. And I'll give you a little secret of that. I think by the time the second one gets there, the parents are just tired and worn out and said, you know what, forget it. Let them, let them do <laughs> whatever. We, we're a little bit more lenient on Travis than probably we were on Shandy. She would probably tell you that. And uh, yeah, I just blame it to the fact that uh, we were old when we had kids and, and we're just old and tired, so, you know, figure it out, son. You're a boy. You'll handle it. Uh, but this is what happened to Joseph, is that Joseph, by no fault of his own, and so his brothers want to kill him, but instead of killing him, they compromise with Reuben, one of the brothers, that says, look, let's throw him in a cistern, basically a hole in the ground. Let's throw him in this hole, and when somebody comes along, we'll sell him. And then we'll go back and tell Dad that uh, he, he's been killed by a wild animal. And so that's what they've done. Joseph is bought and sold to Potiphar, uh, and he's now in Potiphar's house. And as we talked about last week, uh, you know, we talked about uh, that Joseph ran Potiphar's house. Uh, the Lord was with Joseph, even in the midst of his hard time. And I think that's the thing I wanted to share with you tonight, that no matter what you go through, the hard time, no matter how difficult it is, you need to always remember that the Lord is with you. Uh, New Testament, uh, well, we, when we go to the, sorry, when we go to the book of Joshua, we find that jo uh, God told Joshua, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When we go to Hebrews, we find that he's a friend that sticks closer than any brother. So we're never alone in this. The other thing, the thing that, that I would, would share with you tonight is simply because you have something bad happen to you, doesn't mean you should compromise your character. You need to remember that one. Simply because something bad happens to you, you shouldn't compromise your character. The reality is for all of us, we're going to have bad stuff happen in life. It's just part of living here. It's part of living in a fallen world. We can thank Adam and Eve for that. When they fell, all creation felt with it. And uh, if you're a brain, brainiac type of person, you'll know about the law of entropy, that everything, everything decays over time. And so over time, morals and, and, and uh, uh, the way people act decay. And, and we're living in a time where it's gotten worse and worse. But you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, have a choice to make. Do I allow the hardship to change my character or do I respond to the hardship uh, with a purpose that, that I'm serving God, he's got a purpose and plan for my life. And Joseph, uh, if you remember, was committed to living a godly life regardless of the outcome. Now Joseph is, is, is 
made that mind, made that up in his mind. No matter what happens, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live for God. I'm gonna put Him first, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna praise Him. I, I, I like that song you, we sang sometimes. Praise you in this storm. I will lift my hands. And and Joseph was not like that. He was committed. He was gonna live a godly life regardless of what it got him. Someone once asked me about uh, what if I was wrong. What if I was wrong about uh, heaven and there was uh, when we died that was it there was no heaven there was no hell that's just we go get in the ground go sleep and that's the end of it thought about that for just a little bit and 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 here's what I I, I told that person that asked me that and I said look I still think at the end of the day that this is the best way to live life if we're wrong and there is no heaven there is no hell we close our eyes in this life and go to sleep and it's as if we were never here. We're oblivious to anything. Of course, you were that way before you were born. You didn't know what was going on in the world. And I'm sure after you die, if there is nothing else, then uh, the world will go on and we'll have had our time here. And then that's the end of it. We go to sleep and never wake up. I said, even if there is no afterlife, the benefit of living a Christian life is this, is that I've lived a good, wholesome life where I've loved my neighbor I've loved my wife. I've loved my children. I've done the right things. I've had integrity. Uh, I have tried to be a positive influence in my home, in my community, in my church. And I don't see no downside to that. Do you? I mean, I you know, I don't see no downside to living like that. Matter of fact, I can't understand why why most people wouldn't want to live like that. Why most people wouldn't want to live a life surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a life of godliness that that doesn't hurt your neighbor, does nobody wrong. You're not out to get revenge, and you're not out to uh, steal something from your neighbor or to to take your neighbor's wife or or to. Uh, you know, covet what somebody else has got. You're just living your life, serving God, uh, trying to do the right things. Now, with the caveat is this, is that we're always going to fall short uh, of what we should be. But I don't see any downside to living the Christian life. And so I can die, so my answer to him was, I can die knowing that I've lived a good quality life. I've not done anybody wrong. And if that's all there is, hey, I ain't going to know it, so it's all, it's all good. But my rebuttal to him is, what about you? What about you? What if I'm right that there is an afterlife? What if I'm right that there is a God? And if you don't accept His Son, Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior, you're going to a place called hell. But there is a God who sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins that all we have to do is ask Him to forgive us, and He will. What if I'm right? What if I'm right that the Bible says that, that uh, our works here on earth will be uh, rewarded? Now, not rewarded in the, in the ideal of that that's how we get saved. We get saved through the blood of the Lamb by accepting Jesus and allowing His blood to wash us white as snow. But we are rewarded in heaven, the Bible says, for the things we do here on earth. And what if I'm right and we get a reward? If I'm right and you're wrong, of course, this was a man that was a non-Christian. If I'm right and you're wrong, then you've got an eternity of a whole lot of suffering. And I've got an eternity in a place called heaven. But if you're right, I will have lived my life a good way. And I'll close my eyes. And that's it. So Joseph was committed, he committed his life to living godliness regardless of the outcome. Now, we're going to move forward here for just a minute in Joseph's life. Now, he's been sold into slavery. He has uh, traveled to Egypt. He's in Potiphar's house, and he's very successful. Potiphar's put him in charge of everything in his house. He's, a, he's, the, he, he's the boss. He tells him, go here, go there, do this, do that, cut the grass, whatever. Joseph is the man. But one day, the Bible describes uh, Joseph as a, a very fine-looking young man, almost like your, your preacher, just a good-looking dude, right? Uh, much better looking than I am. And uh, 
Potiphar's wife noticed this. And she made an advance. And she made a sexual advance. And she wanted to have sexual relations with Joseph. Now, Joseph's a young man. Now, uh, let's talk straight here for just a minute, okay? Because everybody here is adults. As you get older, the temptation gets less, I think. Uh, you know, just experience or the temptations gets less. When you get older, when you get older, sex doesn't hold the, the place uh, in your life that it does for a young person. Uh, young people, because of, you know, you're at the beginning of that cycle. You're getting testosterone for young men. They're getting, they're, they're about 15, 16 years old. They're getting that, that first burst of that. And as they go through their young, young age, they, you know, that stuff is, the hormones are raging. Same thing for women. And, you know, once you get in your 40s and thereabouts, scientifically we know that testosterone backs off for men and so all that. So this is a young guy who is good looking and probably Potiphar's wife was as well. And she uh, she's basically giving him an open invitation to sleep with her. And Joseph makes this statement in Genesis 39 9. I want you, if you have your Bible, look, at, look that up. Genesis 39 uh, verse 9. He says about himself, no one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing, speaking about Potiphar, he has withheld nothing from me except you. And why did he, uh, why does the Bible say he withheld her? Because you're his wife. So I, I, there's nobody greater in this house but me. And, and nobody can, nobody, uh, can have anything to say over what I say. But the only thing that my master asked me, Joseph said, is that I, I, you're his wife. She's off limits. And so he goes on to say, how can I do this immense evil? And how can I sin against God? So Joseph lays down the law. He says, look, lady, there's nobody else in this house more powerful than I. But you're off limits. And if I do this thing, I, it is a, I am committing evil. He said, how can I do this immense evil? And if I do this, I'm not sinning against just Potiphar. I'm sinning against God. And so he refuses her advances. Well, she kept on. She kept on. She Day after day, she kept on. And listen, it's... I, I was a young man once. Uh, advances like that would be hard to deal with over and over and over again. Uh, and then I'm sure the thought was, you know, with the devil sitting on his shoulder thinking, hey, listen, you ain't going to get caught. You're, you're the greatest person in this household. Uh, Potiphar's not going to find out about it. And uh, he get, after all, he gave you everything. Go ahead. He, he really didn't mean the wife, you know. And you know how the devil does when it comes to sin. He rationalizes with us and tries to make it look like, hey, there ain't no consequences. It's going to be fine. You ain't going to get caught. Uh, you know, and you might not get caught in the beginning. But I, can, I will tell you that just over 47 years of observation, everybody who has an affair eventually gets caught. It just does. You can't keep people quiet. You can't get, far, especially in today's modern time, there's cell phone cameras and people are around everywhere. You can't sneak off enough. You can't, you know, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we had a friend who's, um, who went through um, um, a, um, how I want to put this tactfully, uh, he went through a situation where his wife had an affair. And uh, this was, this was, Man, I don't remember. This has been a long time ago. Uh, probably 20, wow, back in the 90s, I guess, so however long that's been. Um, but his wife was having an affair, and he didn't know what was going on. And eventually everything comes. You can't hide that stuff very long. And so um, one day my wife went to a doctor's appointment in Lexington. And uh, when she come out of the doctor's office, uh, this man 
and this girl that we knew that was married to to a friend uh, was standing somewhere in in a in a public realm um, making out. You know, what the kids call making out, kissing and stuff. Of course, she come home to me and said, "Do we, you know, we tell him?" I said, "No, we'll keep our mouth shut. We're not going to get in the middle of that one." Um, but eventually, he found out. And I've never met anybody that got away with it. Eventually, everybody gets caught. And so, I'm sure the devil told this young guy, "I said, go ahead, man. She's attractive. You're attractive. Go ahead. You're not going to get caught." But eventually, everybody will. The Bible says, "Be sure." Be sure your sins will find you out. So eventually everybody gets caught. And so Joseph denies it. He denies her. He, he refuses her advances. So finally one day she makes this grab for him. Uh, evidently he's in the house. Now there's some, how this is phrased uh, is, is, is open for interpretation of exactly what was going on. Um, some said that he was in the house using the bathroom, you know, uh, it could be, but evidently he was without his shirt. And uh, so she comes on to him, and he flees so quick that he leaves his shirt in the place, and he runs out shirtless. And so obviously now, guess what she's got? She's got an article of his clothing that, guess what? Now she's mad. You've denied me and denied me, and you've uh, refused me. Uh, it, it, so she's like, "Was well, something wrong with me? Oh, I'm not good enough. Uh, oh, uh, uh, you you think you're too good for me? <laughs> you know how? Yeah, women shake. Yeah, yeah. So she's got this piece of clothing that now she's going to use, and she goes back to Mister Potiphar, and she does what? Well, we all know, according to uh, Genesis 39, she accused Joseph of rape, and Potiphar saw the shirt, and that's all he needed. He didn't need to hear nothing else. An angry husband in a fit of rage threw Joseph into prison, even though Joseph had been trustworthy this 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 whole time. Uh, he uh, he puts Joseph in jail. Now you say, hold on a minute, Joseph done the right thing and he suffered. Yeah. In this world, you'll have trouble. Remember what Jesus said? In this world, you'll have trouble. Sometimes doing the right thing will take you in a backwards direction. It will cause you problems. You remember the old uh, saying, no, no good deed goes unpunished? That, that's true in life. Sometimes when you do the right thing, uh, you know, there's consequences. Sometimes God must lead you downhill in order to take you uphill. Now, that, does that make sense? Sometimes God has to take you backwards to move you forward. So not ever backwards stop is the end of the world. And, you know, sometimes God has to, to get you through things uh, in order to, to move you forward. So I've always said this, and, and those who've sat under me any length of time have heard me say this, live your life in such a way that when people talk about you, now did you hear what I just said? When people, not if, live your life in such a way so that when people talk bad about you, they can't do it with a clear conscience, and the people that hear it won't believe it. Me, I'm going to say it again so you can jot that down. Live your life in such a way that when people talk about you, they can't do it with a clear conscience. And those who hear it won't believe it anyways. I, um, I remember when I first left um, Macedonia in Mount Sterling seven years ago, I heard all kinds of things about why I left, and none of them were true. None of them were true. Uh, <laughs> I even got told I had a woman pull a gun on me and threaten to kill me. And, th and that, <laughs> I was like, what? And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, we heard she pulled a gun on you and threatened to kill you. And uh, <laughs> I said, man, where y'all get this stuff at, right? So, you know, people are going to talk about you. People are going to, you know, do things. Me being in the ministry all these years, or people get mad at me over, over stuff, and it happens. And, 
you know, I'm sure I got people running around saying things about me, but you know what? Most people that, people that know me know my character, you know, so I, I don't I don't worry about that a whole lot. And so sometimes God has to take us to the bottom in order to get us to the top. So sometimes you're going to go through moves and times in life that, that seem like you, you're taking steps backward, that you're doing the right thing and you're not getting anywhere. You're doing the right thing and things are getting worse. You keep doing the right thing. Because remember, the Lord is with you. The Lord was with Joseph. And so if He's with you, even when you move backwards, He's going to take you forward eventually. You just got to withstand. You just got to, uh, you know, the Bible says, having done all to stand, stand. If you've done all, put on the whole armor of God, and having done all that, he says, having done all to stand, then what do you do? You stand. You make your stand. You say, you know what? I'm making my stand for godliness. I'm making my stand for a commitment to a life committed to Jesus Christ. No matter what it costs me, I may go backwards. I may not be ever be anything in this world, but I will serve, and I will stand in, in faith believing that God will take care of me. And eventually he will. I think about the move that I made uh, just uh, in, a, in an aspect of, of, um, of how that sort of works. Uh, in 2014, when we left Mount Sterling and came to Cynthiana, I told, told everybody that knows this, I had no intentions of going back into ministry. I was going to take a year off. I'd made up my mind that that's, I was going to take a year off and I was going to rest and just work at UK and then, and then maybe, um, you know, Maybe I would go back into ministry, maybe I wouldn't, but I was going to take a year off. And of course, we know how it worked out now. Somehow or another, they got my number, and, and uh, they called, and God led me over there. But one of the things from a financial standpoint was is that the pay was significantly less than what it was where I had been at. And so you know as well as I do, when you make a certain amount of living, most of us live on everything you know, that we make, we spend it, and uh, having a young family, I was no different than that, and so uh, those first few years there were very difficult where we uh, we struggled, um, just to be perfectly honest with you, uh, we had to make a decision to let a few bills go by the wayside to, to make so that we could make everything else make ends meet, and so there's the consequences of that, getting behind on credit card bills and things of that nature, uh, but we went through all that backwards, didn't know how we were going to make things, didn't know how we were going to make it, but we were going to trust God. I knew God, you know, I knew I was supposed to be here and preach because I didn't want to be in God, you know, okay, you know, it was evident that he wanted me to be here. So uh, I didn't get my year off, and, and uh, so we're just honoring God, trying to do the right thing, and it just seems like everything, bam, 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 one thing after another. Can't make ends meet, something breaks down, you know, uh, I remember several nights going to work and not having anything to eat and hadn't ate dinner because, you know, got up and run to work. And, and so, you know, coming home at 11, 12 o'clock at night and had gone all day and not eating and find something in the refrigerator, some crackers or something because, you, you know, we're, it, was, it was a challenging time. But we stood our ground. I know God called me here. I know God wants me to do a work here. I don't know what, why He called me here. I wanted a, I wanted a break. I was tired. But we fast forward now seven years later, and we see on the flip side what it looks like when you stand through those storms. And listen, all of us are going to have storms in life. It may not be like Joseph that you have that kind of problem, but it might be a health problem. Some of you all are young enough that it might be a job. You might, you might before this year's over, get laid off. You may go through a, a, a time where uh, you're on the unemployment line, and uh, you know it may be difficult. We may go through more, more times like we've been through this year, where you know you have to get in line for a food basket. You've never had to done, do it before in your life. You do what you do got to do to get your family through the hard times. Swallow your pride. And do what you need to do, but keep standing. Don't quit. Don't quit believing God. You keep on believing God, that even in the midst of this hard time, He has still got a plan. 
He's still got something for me to do. He's still got a plan for my life. He's still not, he is with me, even though it's challenging right now. But when I get through the backside of that, there will be no doubt that he was the one who got me through it. Anybody got a testimony like that? That you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was God who got you through it? That you wouldn't be here today had it not been for God? I think we all, if we're honest, we can, we, we can find some of those that if it weren't for God, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have what we got. It was God who gave you the ability to get up and go to work, and it was God who gave you that good paying job, and it was it was God who who did this. It was God who orchestrated that, who worked this out, and put you at that chance meeting to get all this stuff. My favorite verse in all of Scripture, my life verse, if you've ever been baptized by me and got a Bible, uh, you have probably, if I have, unless I've forgotten to do it, I've written this in, in hundreds of Bibles. I don't know in my lifetime, we've probably led... I think just at Macedonia alone, I think we baptized 250 to 300 people in my 13 years there, I believe is what the, what the records are. I got them out in, out in my office. I think it was around 250 to 300. And so let's say in the first, what the man, the first year at Beaver, I baptized 50 people, I think it was, in the first year at Beaver. So let's say in my lifetime I've, I've led 500 people to the Lord and baptized them and and um, it's probably more than that when you think about the prison ministry that we've done. And there was a lot of folks got saved at that. But in, if they got a Bible from me, I wrote this passage of Scripture down. It's found in the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, uh, verses 5 and 6. How many have, of you know this? But If you've been with me long, you, you know this. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. So Joseph was in this place. He's now in now he's in prison. He's falsely accused. What does he do? Well, he could give up and pout and sit in the corner, and he would have probably been in prison the rest of his life. Or he or he made the decision to do this, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means I, I'm not giving up. I know God's got something good for me. I know God's got a plan for me. But it also says this, and do not, uh, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. In other words, quit trying to figure everything out. Because sometimes God uses things that doesn't make sense. Okay? Let me give you an example of that. In 2001, we went to Macedonia to be the interim. And uh, I spent 13 years there, Thir be one of the, be the best 13 years of our life. I mean, it was we had a, just a wonderful time. I, I can't say anything bad at all about my time in, um, at Mount Sterling. I can't do it. Um, you know, did it end the way I wanted it to? No, I, I thought I was going to retire there. But God had me, had other plans. But in 2001, we, we were called to be the interim there. And that's 50 miles from my driveway to the church parking lot, one way. At the same time I was called to be there, I was called and asked to be uh, an interim at a church in Georgetown. And uh, that was, what, from Cynthia to Georgetown, you know, 20 minutes as opposed to an hour and 15 minutes thereabouts. And the thing that, that was, you know, the thing about this was, Georgetown was closer and the pay was better. And everybody that I can't talk with about advice, give me advice about this. They'd say, "You, it's no brainer. Go to Georgetown. Why you want? Because I knew these folks in in Georgetown, and they're like, "Why you want to drive all the way to Mount Sterling with people you don't know? You you've met once when, at a saint when we sang for them. So, but you don't know them. You've never been over there. It's a long way to go. Why would you want to do that? Plus, they're not going to pay you near as much as they're going to pay you." It didn't make sense logically. It didn't make sense uh, logistically. It didn't make sense financially. It didn't make sense spirit to me spiritually because I don't know anybody. You know, let, let me go over and work with people that I know. 
And God said, you go there. You go to Mount Sterling. Sometimes you have to quit fighting with God and just let Him be God. And sometimes we argue and we fuss and we fight with God when He's telling us to do something. Sometimes we just going to have to give up and say, okay. And I say sometimes, I think all the time, you just need to just give up and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. Quit trying to figure it out. This doesn't make sense. Why would God want me to change churches? Why does God want me to join membership in this church? I've been in this other church my whole life. Lean not to your own understanding. That was a season. You've got another season opening up in front of you. You've got a season where God's going to call you to, to another, another place, another church. You know, I, I appreciate people that have been to churches 40 and 50 and 60 years and they've, they've stayed faithful because the church needs faithful people. But I don't ever want you to stay somewhere that God, when God is calling you away. I don't want to lose anybody. But if God is calling you, you follow the will of God. If you're listening to this and, and maybe you've been visiting or whatever and, and you feel God calling you this direction to, to partner up with us at Beaver, then you shake off doubt and just move forward. Lean not to your own understanding. So he says, Proverbs, quit trying to figure it out. Joseph could have spent all of his time in prison figuring out why did, what happened? Why did, why did this go on this way? Could, should I have done this different? God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? He says, quit doing that. He says, rather than lean into your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge Him. Give Him thanks. God, I don't understand why I'm here, but I thank You. God, I don't know why You're letting me go through this, but I'll trust You. Um, God, I don't know why You let my baby gets sick but I'll trust you I don't know why you let my spouse die but I will trust you Lord I don't know why you let me lose my job but I'll trust you Lord I don't know why you let my health fail but I'll trust you Lord I don't know why you you, you done this you done that I don't know why this happened I don't know why they said that I don't know why they didn't come visit I don't know why they did whatever it is just acknowledge God and the promise to this, see, there's, there's a couple things you have to do. All right, let's look at this verse closely. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We have to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, number one. We have to quit trying to figure things out, number two. And we just have to acknowledge Him. That means we give Him praise. We thank Him. Lord, I don't understand it, but I thank You. Lord, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I thank You. And the promise on the backside, when we do those three things, and He will direct our past, or modern version, He will make our past straight. He'll make it all work. It all makes sense. He'll, he'll work it all out. So let me ask you this question in closing. Are you committed to doing the right thing regardless of the consequences? Because we're probably getting ready to live in a day that being a Christian is going to get hard, harder. It's going to get difficult. It's going to be challenging. The devil knows his time is near, so he's going to ratchet it up. So things are going to get tougher. What about you? Are you going to, are you going to commit to God when everybody else around you doesn't? Are you going to commit to doing what's right when it seems easier to do the wrong thing? It's a question all of us got to answer. And if we don't answer that question, we're still going to make a choice one way or another. So it's better to prepare yourself to do the right thing and prepare yourself for the consequences of doing the right thing. Sometimes you, you may lose all your friends for doing the right thing. Sometimes you may lose your status in, in the community for doing the right thing. I, uh, I preached one Sunday morning somewhere. It doesn't matter where. But I, I, uh, one, I did a sermon one Sunday morning and I talked about um, abortion. You know, that we're, we're killing in this country 60 million babies 
uh, since Roe v. Wade. Sixty million. In the state of Kentucky, since the pandemic, since the pandemic started, state of Kentucky, over 4,000 children since the pandemic started have been aborted. 6,000 some people have died from coronavirus. 4,000 children have been murdered. And I preached on this one Sunday morning, and I had somebody walk up to me and say, you know what? Last time that was preached on here, we sent that preacher packet. And my response was, let me know when you want me to leave, and I'll pack and go. Because the truth is the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. I'm doing the right thing. And if the right thing costs me, well, then we're just going to have to deal with it. And so I think that's the thing for all of us. Here was this young man who is doing the right thing, and Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him. But he is committed to doing what is right. And if you, um, you know, if you read the rest of the story, eventually he's rewarded for that. God honors him for that. Do what's right. But you've got to make that decision now before the heat gets on. Are you committed to doing what's right regardless of what it costs you? You see, the problem, friend, is this, is that so many people are not willing to pay the price. This life of a Christian, to get to where I'm challenging us to go is, is difficult. The devil's going to fight you at every, two, every, every spot he can. But you've got to make the decision that I'm not giving up. I'm going to fight. I'm going to, I want this. I want to live a life that's pleasing and honoring to God. You know, when I die, they're never going to be able to say I'm perfect. I at least hope they say I tried. When I die, they'll probably never be able to say that I made a big influence in life. I never pastored a thousand-member church, and I never wrote books on theology, or I never wrote uh, books that made the New York Times number one list. Heck, I don't even have my degree finished. But I hope that my kids can stick me in that hole and lift their head up high saying, you know, at least he tried. He tried. Sometimes he got it right. Sometimes he got it wrong, but he kept trying. He kept trying, he kept on, he didn't quit. I hope things say that about me. And I hope we can say that about you. That because of your love for the Lord, no matter where he takes you or what he brings your way, no matter how good or how bad, you're going to hang in there and you're going to do what's right. And you're going to do what's honoring to God, regardless of what else anybody else does, thinks, or says. Because I'm trusting in the Lord with all my heart. I'm leaning not to my own understanding, but in all my ways I'll acknowledge Him. And my promise, the promise on the backside is that He will direct my path. Listen, we love you. Think about that. Think about that hard. And then let God lead you because He loves you. And wherever He leads you, whether it's tough or it's great besides still waters or through the storms of life, wherever He leads you, He has promised that He'll be right there to walk beside you. Everybody have a great night. God bless. We love you.